Okay, um, welcome everyone. Uh, welcome everyone who is watching us on live on YouTube right now or might be watching later as we record and put this on, on after the event. Uh, my name is Adil Najam. I am the Dean of the Frederick S. Pardee School of Global Studies here at Boston University. And I'm joined today with three of my colleagues, uh, Ambassador Vesko Garsevich, uh, Professor Rachel Nolan, and Professor Mahesh Kara. And all three of my faculty colleagues and myself, we want to have a discussion on why does global studies matter? And why does it matter today and now? Uh, why is global, being global, thinking global important at this moment? And maybe is it important or not? I hope we are joined with uh, prospective students, current students, future uh, scholars, uh, existing scholars, all sorts of people who have an interest in that question. And without any further ado, and uh, I will just pose that question to my colleagues. Does it matter? Does what you do, what I do uh, matter? And what is what lies in the future of our students? So I will uh, move right in. While you do this, I will urge our viewers to please also check out the full CVs of my colleagues on our website, uh, bu.edu slash school. But let me start straight with that question and come to uh, Mahesh Kara. Uh, and uh, to tell us, why do you think what you do matters? And maybe also say a bit about what you do. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so thank you, Dina Jam. Um, so um, my work is actually, I think, quite relevant for what is happening currently in the world. Um, I am a development economist, but I specifically study health, global health and international development and the relationships between them. And um, I think that given the fact that we're having this um, beyond the headlines through Zoom, the fact that we are in the midst of a global pandemic, um, I think that global studies is particularly important at this time because there are agents and forces that transcend beyond established um, borders, beyond, beyond political borders, beyond institutional borders that truly require global thinking. And so, I mean, if, if there's no other better evidence than what we're living through right now, health does not respect country borders. Health does not respect state like state borders. And as a result for that, like when we think about what our present, like in thinking about global studies and how global studies has evolved, not only as an academic discipline, but also as a paradigm around the world, we like we would think about what our predecessor, which would be international, international studies or international relations has established, which is international typically from what I understand and my colleagues definitely are more, are more scholarly in this, in this, than I am, is that international typically associates or studies interactions or relationships between two or more actors within, within, uh, within a realm, but it's usually like one country versus another or one to many countries, but it doesn't necessarily consider the entire globe and what and how forces are, some forces and some movements and some relationships are truly global. To consider the full picture especially now, given what we're living through, it's very important to have a global perspective to understand how, how, these, how these relationships truly transcend any one particular country or set of countries or even regions. And I think that's why global, like taking a global approach to scholarship, taking a global approach to like being a practitioner or to professional uh, approaches is incredibly important at this time. Uh, Mahesh, before yeah. I move to Rachel, if I can push you on one part. Yeah. Now, sure. you work on global health. And yes. particularly, you work on health of the poorest, in the poorest countries, poorest That's communities. Right. That's right. As a global studies issue, mm -hmm. uh, say a bit more about how that very real work that you're doing on the field meshes with this moment when health is something that everyone is now uh, thinking about. Absolutely. So my particular focus in health is maternal and child health. And um, I study maternal and child health both in low and middle income countries, but also as a global discipline. And the reason why I think it's particularly important is because health is a key indicator of 
measures of wealth, because we, what we care about welfare. We care about individual welfare, but we also care about global welfare and social welfare. And one of the key determinants of welfare is how healthy we are. And if, I mean, if for no other reason that if you ever want to just get a good snapshot of how a country is doing or how a society is doing, the first thing that typically um, we would like to look at in terms of their health is look at, look at how women and children are doing. Like, to, like if you wanted to quote unquote, take the temperature of a country, see what maternal health and maternal mortality, see what infant health and infant mortality looks like in a country. And that'll give you also a very good picture of how that country's folk like, is, is performing, how that society is performing socially across a whole lot of other dimensions. Because in some ways, and I, I'm gonna throw this one liner out, health is wealth, like health is well-being. And so in, that, in, in taking that perspective, it's particularly important, no more so than I think at this time in our lives, that we take, we take health as one particular dimension of human well-being seriously. So I think that's why it's particularly important to focus on these forces that don't re necessarily respect any particular established human, human established institution, yeah. Rachel, can you pick up from there your own work um, uh, specifically on, on issues of migration, but also including issues of, 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 of refugees' rights in general, and particularly in Latin America? Um, if someone is, is wanting a, uh, education in global affairs, what was the case you would make to them for why what you do, we do matters? Right. Uh, thanks so much, Dean. And welcome to everyone. Welcome to BU. Thanks for listening. My name is Rachel Nolan. I'm an assistant professor. Um, I'm trained as a historian and I also work as a journalist. And my area of specialty is Latin America. So one thing that I try to help students do is really gain regional expertise. And I think that that's important, and I'll say why in the current moment, but in general, that's very important in order to cultivate a certain humility that I think is really important for practitioners of global affairs. If you remain locked in the mindset of one country or region, it's very easy to assume that you have knowledge that is sort of applicable elsewhere. So what I really try to push students to do is to learn new languages, to get travel experience, such that when they're able to secure positions be they at the State Department, be they in NGOs, be they in whatever field they want to work in, that they really can operationalize not just the knowledge that they've gained at school, but they're to understand what they don't know and to understand how certain perspectives on health perhaps or on migration, and I'll speak to that in a moment, might not match perfectly well between different countries. And of course, Latin America is a very broad region. So there are many, many countries, many languages, not just the major ones, but also Haitian Creole, you know, Quiche, Quechua, all of these many languages and, and regions. But what I really want students to understand is they can't look at the news and try to understand the world only from one country frame. So my specific, so just to think about the news that I was reading this morning before I got on this call, um, very unfortunately, one of the countries in the world where cases is spiking is in Brazil. And so when I was teaching um, US Latin American relations this last spring, I had already planned as part of the course to discuss with students um, what's called the pink tide and the kind of backlash against the pink tide. So the move to left-wing governments after the end of military dictatorships in the Southern Cone at the end of the 20th century, right? And there's been a sort of backlash and a, and a um, fluorescence of more right-wing uh, leadership that harkens back to the military dictatorships. And Jair Bolsonaro, the leader of Brazil, is, the, is one of the prime examples of this. So with that in mind, I was able to lead a discussion with the students and they had some very interesting ideas about why Brazil might be seeing such uh, a, a difficult case of coronavirus and might be unable to deal with it in the way that some other countries in the region have actually been able to deal with it quite well. And so we had students from Brazil in the class, we had students from other Latin American countries, we had students from the US, we had students uh, from everywhere. And it was really helpful to share the kind of different um, uh, country, perhaps stereotypes, so that we could break, break out of that way of thinking and um, really think empirically and historically about why, and more rigorously, right, about why Brazil might be suffering the way that it is uh, right now. So just to answer uh, the Dean's question very briefly about my own research, um, I am uh, currently starting a new project on the history of deportation, and I teach uh, a course on that at BU as well. And that's become important in a way that I never imagined during the current moment, because of course, many national borders have closed. And those who normally could 
uh, at least in theory with great barriers, pass over their, those borders and seek of refuge and seek of asylum, <laughs> um, seeking refuge or seeking asylum are prevented from doing so right now, both because of public health concerns and because coronavirus has been a sort of veil in order to allow the US administration to um, cut down on what they were already trying to cut down on, which was allowing people into the United States. And so it's interesting to note that despite the fact that um, you can no longer get a plane out of Guatemala to go anywhere. Guatemala is my primary site of research and I happened to be there and attempting to get uh, back to the United States uh, after the, the borders were shut, but that's a conversation for another day. Um, what is still actively landing in Guatemala are deportation flights. So while international migration is shut down, deportation is alive and well, despite the efforts of um, civil society and governments in Guatemala and other countries, including um, Honduras to shut down deportation flights, that's been unsuccessful. So I look forward to analyzing that with my students in, in the fall and in the spring when I teach this again. But I think the, the, the primary message that I have is my um, great good luck in my professional life has been to live in many countries around the world, to live and work in Germany and Brazil, in Mexico, in Guatemala. I want that for my students. And particularly, I want the humility that comes with that perspective and the sort of constant scramble to understand things from a new frame. Very good, very good. Let's move to um, Vesko Garcevich, uh, ambassador, professor now. Uh, and, and, and you do, you know, diplomacy. Uh, both as a practitioner and now as, as, as an academic, uh, and these traditional tools as well as avenues of international affairs. Why does it matter now? Uh, thank you, Adil. Welcome to everybody um, to this event. Uh, I'm Vesko Gacevic, as the dean of the school uh, introduced me. Um, I spent 26 years working in diplomacy in different places, uh, but most of my time I spent working in multilateral diplomacy in international organizations. And this is a departing point for me to teach my students how multilateralism and cooperation between states matter in uh, uh, the current world. I think. Uh, uh, as we uh, we are as, uh, and has never been connected as we are these days. Therefore, you know, uh, uh, multilateralism and the joint efforts matters very much. Uh, the current crisis and the pandemic is a wake up call that uh, uh, the state centric system, which is which was created long time ago and which has been in place for so long, uh, which uh, actually revolves around. Uh, concept of sovereignty of states and territorial integrity uh, is to be reformulated uh, and countries uh, of, I think, this pandemic and number of other asymmetric threats, or let's say uh, human-centric threats, uh, show that uh, uh, this uh, system we have in place uh, made us feel sometimes defenseless as it is the case with the pandemic. And therefore we need to develop something more something else on um, on the basis of what we have now because this system uh, as so uh, cannot be cannot be efficient enough and this is a time where where as uh, a question of multilateralism and cooperation um, comes to uh, the game so uh, in my classes uh, first of all diplomatic practice class and uh, negotiation class but as well as intercultural communication class we cooperate we discuss um, uh, the need for cooperation and intercultural uh, communication class we discuss the need to understand differences to understand diversity to accept acknowledge that diversity to understand all identities and how um, cultural uh, background shapes up uh, what we think, how we act, how we see others, and also to accept that uh, being in, uh, involved and being exposed to other cultures, uh, uh, being fully in the process of, uh, let's say, globalization, will not take anything out from our identity, actually will enrich us uh, because giving us chance to understand others. So coming back to multilateralism and the need to, for cooperation, I think that this crisis, not only this crisis, there are a number of issues which are around for some time, like a climate change, energy, um, energy security, food, food and water management, and the fight against terrorism. Finally, discrimination. We know what's going on right now in the U.S., but it's not just the U.S. case because discrimination has different forms. Uh, uh, it is based on uh, or ethnic background, religious background, sexual orientation, 
uh, or um, you know uh, any other any other any other or, uh, or gender so then we need to work together in order to overcome these problems and i think that now the one of the challenges behind uh, above us or uh, in front of us is how to formulate a new policy global policy how to go a step further from um, well established narratives that countries more or less share that which uh, it identified problems but uh, to go further from there and to um, you know transfer these narratives uh, uh, into uh, uh, something which can be considered as a global practice uh, to address global challenges Th thank you thank you all um, let me throw a question anyone can 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 take it but um, as young people might be listening to you now or, or, or in, when they see the recording, what do you tell them, someone who's thinking about studying global affairs, what does that mean? If they're in your class, what does that mean to study global affairs? We, we often say at the school that uh, we don't want our students just to understand the news better, we want them to change the news. Uh, through, through their actions, because we are in the business of, of creating young professionals in global affairs. So, so what does that mean when they are in your class, for example, Mahesh? Yeah, <clears throat> so I think the, like a lot of the themes that I would like to impart on my students are, have actually been mentioned um, by uh, Veshko and Rachel. Um, and I think the main, the underlying theme that I would like to reinforce in students is that while in this world we, like, we hear the terms globalization, we hear the terms global order, we hear the terms um, like international collaboration and cooperation all the time, but it's hard to actually conceptualize what that looks like. And I think a lot of times, it, like especially today, the, the underlying narratives is that we try to find ways in which we are different from other communities and which like there's so many ways of trying to identify. And this is going to Veshko's point about like ways like diver in diversity, we always try to find ways to distinguish ourselves. But in like, there's such a common humanity and there's so many, there's so many things that we find and that we have more in common with each other than we have to, that then we have that are different from one another that I think that like embracing and understanding that common humanity throughout, like, like whether you're studying women in Malawi, whether you're studying like youth in Egypt, whether you're studying movements in Eastern Europe, like they all have <laughs> underlying they all have underlying common themes, and I think the I think the the connection and the common humanity is something that I really want to impart in my students. And to that end, like in order to be effective global citizens, like that is actually one of the key missions of the Party School. I my view, and I think this is a view that a lot of the I mean all the professors at Party share is you have to like you have to embrace a global view by understanding thing, like understanding issues, understanding um, concepts and embracing communities outside of your own, like where, thing, where, the, where there are commonalities, where there are differences and how, the, to what extent do these differences actually matter? Um, and also understanding and taking interdisciplinary approaches to this, this comprehension. I'm an economist, but I completely respect other and opposing um, other points of disciplinary approaches like his history. Like it's so important to understand history. It's so important to understand um, politi like politics. It's very important to understand how diplomats think, how, how states craft and statesmanship is formed. Like all of these, all of these are interlinked. And I think that like understanding the understanding these approaches comprehensively, technically, and rigorously is the challenge of a global citizen. And it's much, it's much easier said than done. Like one, like just by going and traveling to other countries, I don't think suffices to say that one is a global citizen. Like I, I like the, the last thing that one that I would ever want to impart in a student is to say that go be a good volunteer. That's not, that's not the goal. The goal is like if you really want to understand and embrace a global, like a global perspective you have to give yourself the chance to embrace a global perspective and be open-minded, both in terms of technical discipline, in terms of academic rigor, and in terms of, pol in, in terms of understanding a global policy order. So that, and, that's what I would impart. And, and humble as, as Mahesh is, um, he, he, uh, I, I will add that you know, one of the ways he does that is, for example, taking his students with him on his own research. 
uh, for example, to Zambia, to go not again for that volunteer, but to go and spend uh, the type of time that makes you understand a place deeply. Yeah. Right? And, and, and that's one of those core, where we, we come to these sort of four Ps as we call it, to understand a place deeply, not just to have been to a place, uh, but, but, but to understand it. Uh, Rachel, any thoughts on, you know, what should students be looking forward to or expecting as they, as they embark on careers in, uh, or education in global affairs? Sure, um, thanks so much. I think one of the things that's really exciting for students when they embark on a career in global affairs is to see just how broad global affairs can be. When I'm teaching I, and, and when I'm mentoring students, I want them just not to, not to think necessarily about international relations narrowly defined, but rather to start to see global studies and global affairs in places that they might not expect them. So my first book, for example, which I'm struggling to finish now is on the history of international adoption, which is, of course, uh, in many cases, a private contract between families with minimal government involvement, but I, I see as a very profound form of global affairs, naturally, because transnational adoption is, is literally the most intimate form that that can take. I also emphasize to students that um, politics that they might see as national, often when viewed rigorously, are global. So for example, the um, the course that I teach on the history of uh, deportation and deportation politics and international relations is is a history of anti is is a history of racism in many ways, right? So of course that's very difficult to discuss, but I really try to help students see how that history of racism crosses borders. So just to give one example that I always teach. Um, there was a mass deportation raid in, in the United States in 1954, and what people called Operation Wetback, the name of it is actually a racial slur, and what people and certainly students often don't understand is that Operation Wetback was a bilateral agreement between the U.S. government and the Mexican government, in which the Mexican government was looking for the return of cheap laborers to work their own agriculture, for their own agricultural needs, and agreed with the U.S. government to pick up Mexican deportees at the border and deport them further into the United States, uh, further into Mexico, excuse me. So the Mexican government picked up deportees at the US-Mexico border, deporting them further into Mexico so that it would be more difficult for those deportees to return to the United States. And Operation Wetback is a program that uh, the current president of the United States, Donald Trump, has referred to very positively. So it's important to know that history and to know that it's not just a US decision to expel over 1 million Mexican deportees in 1954, but that that was actually a global agreement forged between two states. And Vesco, anything in uh, our uh, classes to happen? To that from my perspective, from the angle of a, of a, 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 of a practitioner, uh, I fully agree with what uh, Mahesh and uh, Rachel said um, of uh, how, you know, uh, in order to become a global citizen, you need to understand the world and global affairs very well. But you need to understand all nuances that exist in this world to other other countries and their their national interests. Because you you and you have to be um, engaged in it in order to bring about change. Because every young uh, person uh, believe about change and it's a good thing because they are they are driven by the idea to bring about change. In order to bring about change at a global level, first you need to uh, be engaged in a national level, as you Rachel said. Uh, national policies uh, have global some something global in themselves. So uh, you don't need to just to think globally. You can think nationally, but to keep global things in your mind. So and you need to understand other. You need to understand others. For example, what I do um, in uh, um, is uh, uh, during the simulations, and there is one going on right now about uh, uh, this is a simulation of an international conference on, on Middle East. I usually give uh, students countries to play, uh, which are not familiar, they're not familiar with. Um, that gives them chance uh, to learn something about uh, those countries, uh, to put their shoes on and to act as their diplomats uh, and to understand their, uh, their national interests better. Sometimes um, I give, for example, I had a couple of students who are from the region but believe, uh, belong to other Sunni or Shia, um, uh, a, a part of Islam um, communities. I give them uh, roles of uh, countries that belong to other side. So, uh, so for them to understand the logic and motives and interests of countries uh, that are, okay, mostly by media or by official um, narratives seen as uh, rivals, let's say so. So that helps a lot uh, and teaches them to understand others 
uh, because it is needed for cooperation. Let me throw a question that's come from one of the viewers and, and I'll, I'll reform the question so that everyone can maybe participate. It's, it's a very interesting question that uh, Haldun is asking, which is, can you think of real world examples right now where the lack of that global perspective you're talking about has led to real world problems? Best call. Okay, I don't want to criticize anybody uh, outside of my region, but speaking about it, let's be, let's be focused on the EU because I come from Europe. Therefore, I feel comfortable every time criticizing part of the world I come from. So we all speak about cooperation, but when uh, the pandemic uh, broke out in Europe, people, uh, what people saw at the first moment was just borders and walls building up, uh, be, uh, uh, being built around them. So I don't want to say here that uh, nations, uh, states are not responsible for health of their citizens in this case. And this, again, it is to highlight what Rachel and uh, Mahesh said, you know, states and, are responsible. But nevertheless, what was lacking at that point uh, is a cooperation, with, at least in the, in, in the European Union, which is considered to be, um, uh, you know, union among states ready, committed, to cooperating more and better than others. Um, just one more point, and I will, I will, I will, I will, I will finish. You know, it took more than two months for leaders of G20 to organize first meeting to discuss uh, the pandemic. The meeting took place in March, late March, and I refer to it in one of my opens. This is a sign how what I mentioned at the beginning: state-centric system actually has shaped our own minds. And we have difficulty, uh, even in, even confronting with crises like this, to walk out from that and to think globally. I think that generations to come should make that uh, should make change possible. Yeah. Rachel, sure. I just wanted to add on to that by saying that uh, as part of my research, I sometimes read um, cables from embassies throughout Latin America back to Washington. You know, and sometimes I need to do Freedom of Information Act FOIAs in order to get access to those cables that have been classified, etc. And um, I'm often shocked and horrified to find. Our state, our state department officials, you know, um, people working for the U.S. government throughout Latin America, lazily repeating cliches about the countries in which they're living. And it's a perfect example of what my colleagues were saying. It's not enough to live in a country to be a truly global citizen. So I'll give an example of the cables from Guatemala to uh, uh, Guatemala City to Washington. Sometimes repeat cliches about Mayans. You know, half of the population in Guatemala is indigenous. There's a lot of anti-indigenous racism and some of that racism is expressed through the idea that Mayans are perhaps naturally violent or something like this. And I will sometimes see those cables, you know, and I'm I'm ashamed and horrified that that's my own government and that those cables were the basis of some of the decisions that we've made in those countries. So I think it's really important for students to be educated out of that kind of cliched way of thinking. And one way is through a rigorous study of history. Another is through these um, simulations that Veshko and other colleagues do with students, which I think are so important. I can't tell you, Veshko, I've probably told you that I have students come knock on my door who are in my class and in your class and say, I've been assigned to play Mexico. What do I read? I mean, I, I, I need to be inside some, some kind of Mexican diplomatic way of thinking and I'm panicking because I, I don't know very, very much. So I think that's a very active way of getting students interested in learning something much more intimately than this kind of surface cliche uh, that unfortunately can be repeated and that, that can be a problem. Mahesh, same question, yeah. uh, things yeah. that, that have caused real problems because the world doesn't think global enough. I mean, I think we've all been circling around the larger topic of the pandemic and how states and institutions and people have been responding to this pandemic. And so, I mean, I think that's just the most prescient um, and relevant topic of like that that's showing how unified or how un disunited we are, like ununited we are across the world. And um, I think that like, in, I mean, I'm an economist and I, and I study human behavior. Like that's really what economics is at the heart of, at the heart of the core of economics in terms of it's as a discipline, we study human behavior. And what's interesting is that in our zeal to try to like distinguish ourselves and to identify ourselves, like I don't want to quote Benedict Anderson about imagined communities and national identity, but it goes back to this concept where like we strive to find like commonality across dimensions, race, ethnicity, language across the world. 
but we often forget that in in our in our effort to do so that we forget that we have a larger common like human like there's a there's a larger commonality and we have more things in common across the world than we have like than we have in terms of our differences and there's no better example than in than than what we are living through our lived experience currently which is in a health crisis health does not respect borders we have not been like there's no point in the world where people have been more mobile, where people have been able to travel and to move across borders as much as we have today. And, and, and in that sense, like, because when crises hit and when people are trying to minimize their own personal costs, like either at a, at a level of a nation or at the level of community, we forget that, like, we forget that there is a greater public good that if we were to think about investing in that larger public good, in this case, we would call it the global order that would actually give us larger welfare gains arguably than even even thinking about our own our own communities as we have imagined them like i would i would give it no better like no better example than if you were to actually see how the coronavirus has differentially impacted different co countries across the world and if you actually look and see where the coronavirus has struck hardest and as a result of policy response, as a result of how these communities take sense to which these communities and countries have been open or closed, like you can see that the variation in the outcomes are directly commensurate to the extent to which the, there's variation in how people have been open or closed to like to receiving help, to seeking help, and also to offering help across the world in a time when the world needs to come together in order to combat something that is truly affecting all of humanity. You know, and I think that's a very difficult thing because we are so ingrained in thinking about the private costs, right? And like, what is the cost to us? What is the cost to our country? Like either through the veil of nationalism, through the veil of like a community identity that we forget that there, there are things that there are agents and there are actors and forces that tr transcend any of those costs. And unless we're able to internalize them, it doesn't matter. Health does not, like the pandemic does not respect whether you're from Algeria, or whether you're from Albania, it doesn't matter. <laughs> like, it, like, and in that case, like you have to think of how, how these communities need, like have to actively find it, find ways of making it incentive compatible for them to actually come together. It has to be built in, it has to be factored in. And that requires effort. Just to build on that, you know, the virus is not the only thing that doesn't really respect those little lines Absolutely drawn not. maps and, and flags that we, we, we put up. Uh, but, but it's not the only thing that forces us to confront the question of what is good for us versus only what is good for me. Yeah. Because very often we are now confronted with issues where what is good for me is good for us. And if we don't get to the good for us, we will not get to the good for me. And one example is, is uh, climate change, something that I work on. Absolutely. So I'm sitting here in Boston. If I get into my car and drive north and go into Canada, at some point, someone will stop me and ask me for a passport. But the carbon molecule from my car doesn't need a passport. You know, those little carbon molecules don't have little flags on that. It's going to go up there and it's going to find its way to Canada. It's probably going to find its way to Montenegro. Uh, and it's going to find its way to changing the global climate. And much, much, much like the virus, it will, it will change these dynamics. And in, in some ways, I think those are amongst the types of challenges. In addition to all the existing challenges, whether they be the challenges of war or the challenges of hunger, something we haven't talked about with a lot of our colleagues, colleagues, uh, 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 work on challenges of poverty, uh, challenges of wealth, challenges mm -hmm. of global trade. Right? We have constructed a world which I think in some ways we should even be proud of where the well-being of the many has been increased, but, but which still forces us to confront the question that there are those whose well-being has not been increased, might even have been decreased. And therefore, these questions of justice, these questions of fairness, and these questions of well-being, I would argue, are, are very central to the ethos of all that we do. Uh, but but let, me, let me throw this back uh, at, at, at my, my colleagues. And again, thinking about young people wanting to make a career in this. So what do they do? Right? I mean, you teach, you, you work, but a young person comes, takes your classes, and goes out. What do they do and what do you want them to do? Vesco? Uh, maybe uh, 
it's easier for me to say what I want them to do is actually, if they want to, it depends on what type of career they would like to pursue. Many would like to pursue career um, in international relations um, and want to be, to work for either non-governmental um, uh, actors, uh, either think tanks, NGOs, or big, or to work for their governments or to work for international organizations. I advise them uh, to keep what we discussed um, in the class, in all classes in mind, to keep it in mind and to try to bring about change, to understand the world, to understand definitely, definitely be realistic. You know, if you work for your government, you have to take into account uh, national interests of your state. But also you, you are always in, a, in the situation to bring into this a story um, and a global perspective. Without global perspective, as you rightly said, Adil, uh, in, uh, in the future, government, states, or system that we created uh, doesn't make sense because uh, all future threats or all current threats, um, uh, they don't recognize borders that we created. Or system, system we created is traditional uh, system. We created system to defend ourselves from humans, from other humans, from intruders from aliens, but aliens from other nations, but new aliens, if I can call them like this, they don't recognize the old system and therefore we need to have another answer. And I think that they either work for the UN, which is a global organization and whatever people in some countries think about its inefficiency, I always que question them or try to push them back to think about who is responsible for the UN um, uh, the inefficiency, states or the UN itself, because states call a tune, uh, not the UN. Therefore, I ask them to be more engaged, to keep this global perspective uh, all the time, but working on their national agendas. Uh, let me move to the others, but just by way of example, only yesterday we heard from one of our recent graduates who just graduated a few months ago, a few weeks ago, actually, that she will be starting off in the U.S. State Department in the Department of Public Diplomacy, working there. And then, so, so again, you know, very concrete example of what Veshko was talking about. Uh, the the head of the Massachusetts uh, Girl Guides is 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 one of our one of our. Uh, former students, um, uh, people working in trade, whether in international organizations or with think tanks, a number of them working in, in the private sector, right? Because it's not just governments that's, that have become global. Companies have become global. A very large number in the environmental arena. Uh, but I could go on and on, but let me let me move to Rachel and sort of maybe ask this. If I add, Adil, uh, uh, you inspired me. I have two students as a two examples. One of them working for for private sector, and she is now in charge of a project. I think one billion dollars valued project uh, in Mongolia. Uh, so, uh, and that project is designed is aimed at uh, providing uh, um, assistance uh, in um, electric something concerning electricity uh, for people living there. Another student, he works in a, in a, in an NGO in uh, in DC that gets together students from Middle East. Uh, and students from um, U.S. Um, to have online together, to have together online courses, you know, and this is how they uh, they don't travel because some students cannot afford study abroad programs, but they still have chance to work with students from other parts of the world uh, and to and to do something useful. Yeah, uh, I'll come to Rachel. I'll throw one more Master Chat, uh, not um, Admiral Chatfield. Uh, first female to become president of the Naval War College. Uh, again, one of our, our alumni from here at the Party School. But, but Rachel, back to this question, what do, you, what do we want them to do? Right. If we're getting to the bragging about students portion of the day, that's, that's a big part of the day. So I, won't, I won't give more examples, but that is a fun part. Um, what I most want is to talk to students and ascertain what it is that they want. And I think in many cases, students have a kind of general idea that working in X field or Y field might look like X or Y. But I always tell them, really, and I, I often help them set up informational interviews or something like that, because I want them to have a real concrete sense of day to day, what does that job look like? And if they're going to be able to push change in that organization or in that government or in that NGO, what, wherever they are, 
how will that work in a nuts and bolts uh, fashion on a day-to-day -day basis? And so just to give one example, I'm so glad you brought up climate change because I'm currently revising some of my syllabi to include more readings on uh, climate change, Latin America and international relations because that's a real demand from the students. And that gives me hope. This is something that they're interested in, they're writing papers on. So I have one student and I'll just give one example that wrote an excellent paper on um, uh, a framework for climate change refugees coming from Latin America because we know that one of the things that's driving out migration, particularly from Guatemala, is climate change and the drying out of cornfields and, and, and all of the kind of knock-on effects that that has had. So this student is currently revising that paper and I think is going to use it to apply to law school, but she's interested in long-term environmental uh, international policy. So that's just the kind of thing that students might be able to do. Um, and, and then students who are interested in working in other arenas our many practitioners help in very practical ways to, to find them contacts. Same with us academics, because we travel, work often in DC or in very, in my case, various parts of Latin America, we do have uh, contacts and and it's, it's, it's less just setting someone up with a job and more setting them up with someone who can really tell them what that, what that experience is like so that can, they can get a sense of how they can best match their interest and their desire to make change with a particular, um, job or a particular day-to-day -day life, even more importantly. And, and uh, as I come to Mahesh, I wanted to pick on this word you used, you know, jobs are uh, clearly sort of things that we want to think about, but we also want to think about career, which is a different thing, which is about work, right? So, so which is the why of it? And, and my own sense is that A, the world needs a lot of work to be done. And there are, in fact, far more opportunities. Uh, the way I think about it, the minimum I want my student to do, do it, and Mahesh, I'll come to the very minimum is a student should get out of, uh, whether it's the party school or any program anywhere, and know what is happening in the world. Right? In a way, that's the minimum responsibility. But then you want them more than just knowing what is happening to understand why things happen the way they happen. And I do think that the ultimate goal and the most important goal is then to be able to connect those two dots and get to how to change it to make it better. And, and, and that I think is where the responsibility, but also the opportunity is. And my own sense, and we'll come to this after we hear from Mahesh, my own sense is that this COVID world we are now in is going to create both new areas of responsibility and opportunity to change things, to make them better, not only in the areas we are talking about, you know, because of what we work in climate or health or diplomacy or, or equities, but on other areas, on security, on, uh, on, on, on politics, on rights, on health, on uh, uh, hunger and so on and so forth. But Mahesh, uh, thoughts from you. Well, I'm glad that you made my job easy because that's pretty much what I was, I, I was very much going on along the same line. Um, I think that, um, what, when I see students coming in, particularly when they come in their first semester, they have lots of interests, they have lots of goals and ambitions. And I, and I think that like what they're looking for is a way to channel those, that, that energy. And what I tell them is there are so many ways in which you can be productive and useful, um, particularly as you go through school, as you graduate in undergrad or as you graduate in grad school where you have opportunities, not just to say that this is what I'm interested in, but this is how I can, I can be value added to that initiative, to that goal. Like I will, my, my advice to students is you will learn as much, if not more on the job, uh, in the field, in whichever context you are, as you will in school. But what school offers you is the chance to, is the chance to develop your skills, to critically think to actually develop technical competencies that will be useful to you when you go to work. Now, whether you decide to be an academic, whether you decide to be a practitioner, whether you decide to go into policy and policy making, that those avenues, all of them are, all of them contribute to the overarching goal of making the world a better place in different ways. And that and, and those lines of work all are complementary to one another. So where you start is not going to necessarily be where you end. Like you may start as a practitioner and end up being an academic or start as a policymaker and end up being a practitioner. That's fine as you decide to, as you learn more about the work that you do. But the main thing that I, that I think that the value added of a school is, is that it allows you to, 
like to take a step back, see the big picture and critically assess where, like what does the world look like? What are the gaps in particular domains? Whether it's climate change, like why does the world like work or not work in, in the face of climate change? Why does the work work like world work or not work in the face of human trafficking and migration? Like why, like how, do, like what are the key problems that are that are generated as a result of these in as a result of these insufficiencies across the world and that understanding not only what the identifying the what but the how and the why and what can you specifically do about it by having the skills and the, and the technical expertise and the regional expertise in order to be able to understand this will give you a better idea of what the global order and what what your global contribution could be and and that's that's what i like to leave students with and NGOs, you know, NGOs, academia, more, more, more schooling, PhDs, diplomacy, states, the state governments, does all of those are just like the avenues and the channels through which a student can eventually be productive. And in some ways, like that, those are all, that's all, I, I find that to be of second order compared to like, understand, like having a student understand like this is where they can truly be productive. And this and is I, where their value added really lies. Yeah. And I, I do, I'm, I'm very glad all of you made that point. And I, I wanted to sort of amplify it further by, because I do think it's an important message. There is in fact, a lot of work to be done. Right? Yeah. Uh, the, the, the point of understanding issues is, is so that we can make them better. We can do something. I'll give you an example. A student um, years ago of mine uh, now, he was from, his name was now, uh, his name is now, he's from Japan, uh, worked on climate change in my class. Right now he is uh, at WWF in Japan and leads their climate change, international climate change work. And I, I mention him again, because as Mahesh was saying, there are multiple pathways to getting to how you make or try to make the world a better place. But there is an actual agenda of things to be done. The reason I think people come to or should come to global affairs, international affairs, whatever you want to call it, is they, they see things that they are passionate about that they want to make better. And our job as, as scholars and teachers is to help them, I hope, find the tools, find the opportunities, find the ways of understanding and thinking about things so that they can chart that path to actually making the world a better place. And I, I, I do think, I mean, I'm an optimist. I wear yellow shirts for God's sake. I'm an optimist. I think the world has improved. The challenge is not that we haven't done anything. The challenge is we haven't done as much as we could have. The challenge is we have more food than is needed to feed every person in the world. And yet people will sleep hungry tonight. That's a doable challenge because we know we have the food. It's not the challenge of 100 years ago when there wasn't enough food. The challenge is that we have the knowledge to make the health of people better. The challenge is that we have the wealth for no one to be in abject poverty. And, and in some ways, I think we look towards our students and our community as our legacy of how to take these ideas and translate them into action. But as we begin sort of coming towards the end, let me make this one more sort of round. If you, if you, uh, and then you kind of do, if you were talking to a student right now, what do you think you would say to them is the most important thing they should be thinking about if they are thinking about making a profession, a career in international affairs? Who wants to go? Mahesh. Yeah. Um... I, and I, this actually follows very much from your last point, um, Adil, is that the chat, I mean, in thinking about the challenges, I think students come in with a lot of passion. They come in with like a sense of, they like whether that sense of direction is refined or not, like in students, there's a large variation in, the, in understanding what they're interested in. But I, I ask students to first be open-minded about their interests, to, like, to understand that their interests can change. But, the, but what students can learn from the party school and what the party school offers are skills, are, is skills, is contextual knowledge, it's regional expertise, it's global scholarship. And I think that those are things that, as you mentioned, are the tools that students need in order to, like th those are the channels through which students can actually be productive. And I, I mean, my, my, 
I, I, I hold my students to, I think, a pretty high standard. And I would like to add, and I think we all do in, in each of our classes and each of our respective domains. But like the one thing I tell my students is like, the world needs the world needs smart people. The world needs technical expertise, and the world needs like like competent, skilled um, expertise. Like that's what the party school can offer. And my my goal for students is to say take the hardest, most challenging, most different classes that you possibly can take at the school while you're here, because those are the school those are the classes that will challenge you and that where you will learn the most and where you will actually have the most number of skills to prepare you for what the, what the world looks like. Um, that's, that's where, that's the value added of a school. That's really the value added of a program is that I, I'm, I, I would not ever say to a student that like, just do the do courses that you know that you're good at just because you, just because you can get an A and like say that you've done a good job at the party school. That's not the goal of a school. If, if you know that you're, if you know that you have expertise or that you know that you have a comparative advantage in one, in one area, gain comparative advantages in others. Like the world needs broad interdisciplinary thinking where you are not, I wouldn't even say that you should be a jack of trade in that many disciplines, be an ace of trade in all disciplines. And that's, and that's a tall order, but that's a, that's a challenge that all students should rise to. And that's what I would, in, that, that's what I would hope to impart to, the, uh, to any student coming into the party school. Rachel? Um, another skill that I think is really important that students want and need and we can really and we do help them um, gain are various kinds of communication skills. These are very these are actually very hard skills right so writing whether it is policy memos uh, research papers. That's a skill that they need, whatever their professional trajectory, whatever their career looks like, oral presentations similarly. The, uh, the only other thing I want to add to Mahesh's really good point about skills is um, what I try to impart to students and what I see my colleagues imparting as well is the ability to think critically enough that the students can ask questions and then do research or do um, something to answer those questions. So just to give an example, um, it's not just a question of reading the books, you know, listening to the lectures and saying, ah, yes, now I have something of a structure to understand Latin America. No, I had a student um, this year who is engaged in a really interesting master's thesis um, because she had a question about uh, the Venezuela situation, which has been very much in the news. And so people are aware, for example, that one in 10 Venezuelans has had to flee the country. It's a massive humanitarian crisis. What is not so often in the US news because we are so provincial in some ways and US focused is that the vast majority of those refugees are in Colombia. And so this student was actually able to get a travel grant through the party school, travel to Bogota, do archival research, do interviews with, with people who are making the policies to receive Venezuelan refugees in any way that they can. It's not a perfect effort. And now she, she has this master's thesis on the topic that is really original. People are not doing that research. So she had a question that is clearly politically important in terms of global affairs. And she was able to learn the skills to answer that question for herself and come up with some results that were quite surprising. So that I think is the best case scenario. Reshka? Uh, maybe to reiterate what my uh, colleague said, you know, uh, Mahesh and, and Rachel uh, nicely uh, phrased what school offers, and I agree fully with uh, uh, this, uh, and I will highlight this interdisciplinary approach. And uh, what I want to put uh, on on top of it is that students are given chance to apply what they learn in the in their classes and to apply, uh, for example, if they discuss in your class, Adil or Rachel class about climate change, then they have chance in my class to write a paper about Paris Agreement uh, and how countries negotiated to come to that point to have to have an agreement about climate change. So they are allowed, they are given chance to bring up um, uh, issues maybe uh, which are maybe below global radar, but are very relevant for certain parts of the world. And to discuss those issues in all classes or to write papers about it, to do research about it, because as our world is interconnected, so are all, all classes. This is one of my point. The second point is that uh, uh, um, uh, by definitely by supporting them to critically think and to apply analytical skills, to give them sort of optimism that change is possible. And that change begins with the small changes they can make um, in their communities. No, thank you, thank you, thank you very much. I think all of you, all of you have raised this point variously in this as well as other questions. I believe, I believe that the future belongs to those who can connect dots. 
the future will belong, and, and I, by future, I mean even the immediate future, that we are kind of uh, not done with, but, but the world is, it's no longer enough to just know your debt dot well enough. Uh, the future will belong to those who can put ideas together, whether they are ideas about geography, what is happening in various parts and learn from one to the other, or connect the connections that Rachel was talking about, about how what happens here is very dependent on what has happened there. Uh, or whether it is the type of connections of dots that we are talking about institutions, that if you're really interested in the health of a, uh, of a uh, maternal health of a woman in, in Zambia, then it matters what the Zambian government is doing, but it also matters what an international organization is doing. It also matters what the EU is doing in its aid policy. And all of that is not just interesting. It is important if the goal is to change things. So my sense has been, and I think this is at least for me, part of the ethos of what we are trying to do here, that the future belongs to those who can connect dots. But we need to understand, understand those dots before we join them in meaningful ways. I think the future also belongs, especially now in this post-COVID world we are already in to those who are committed to change. There is a unique opportunity, I think, that this generation of students has, which, which doesn't come very often. Because the world is all, call it turmoil, all in change. So many things have been thrown up. That means a lot of things will have to be reorganized. And the challenge of change is, can we influence that reorganization in ways that takes the world to a better place. That reorganization could go in, in nasty places, right? Whether it's on immigration, whether it's on health, whether it's on, 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 on trade, but they could also go in much more interesting and much more productive ways, right? And that I think is the great opportunity that the generation of young people who will be entering, uh, entering this, this, this field at this point or leaving in this field, will have. I think it will make part of their job more difficult because the responsibility will be great. Uh, but in a way, they are not going to be in a world that is sort of steady. But because it is in flux, there will be lots of levers of change. They'll certainly be there. I'm looking at Mahesh in terms of public health, right? Questions have been asked. People have understood. Everyone is saying, okay, what needs to be done differently? They'll be there in the realm of international cooperation. How will the EU change? And can my ideas and my action change it? How will immigration be affected? And those, I think, are choices that the world will have to make. And all of us, and I'll end with this thought as I end my, uh, help, uh, thank my colleagues, all of us have a responsibility to be not just part of that conversation, but if you are interested in global affairs, then you have a responsibility to help shape the changing world. And I think you will have not just the responsibility, but the opportunity to do so. That to me is why it is an exciting time to think about global, to think about global affairs. Let me please thank all my colleagues, uh, Rachel Nolan, Mahesh Kara, Mr. Gersovich, for their, for their time here. Let me thank you for tuning in now or in recording and please, I look forward, we all look forward to seeing uh, many of you here in Boston, but wherever you are, think global. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks so much. Thank you.